Blog Talk Radio. Broadcasting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Max Worley the Third. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm back on the show to inspire you to stand up for right. So that's the book show. Your grassroots back movement. It's the on the move movement, and it cannot function without you. I want to thank each and every one of you for your patriotism and for taking the time to get involved. We're going to dive right in today. Uh, we've got a lot of news uh, that we are going to try to cover. Uh, the date is June 15th, 2014, and we have a really good show in store for you. I'm pretty excited about it. Today, around uh, 5.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to be joined by a special guest and Libertarian Party candidate Dave Steenson. Uh, we're going to be talking about whatever else comes up, so whatever you would like to bring up is on the table. Feel free to call in with your own topics. Anything that you'd like to discuss, uh, we'll be taking your calls and reading your emails. So if you'd like to join the conversation today, please Give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Don't forget to check us out online at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and don't forget to check that little follow button on the uh, Blog Talk Radio. That way you can uh, get updated anytime we're having uh, you know any episodes coming up. There may be times we'll we'll do some kind of emergency broadcast in the middle of the week. So uh, we've yet to do that, but that is a distinct possibility in the future. So make sure you follow us here at blogtalkradio.com. And uh, you can check us out at facebook.com forward slash on the move show. Uh, don't forget to like our page there. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash on the move show. We got original content that we put out there at least uh, one video a week. And uh, feel free to also follow us on Twitter.com forward slash On The Move Show. Uh, we got a store on our website, OnTheMoveShow.com. You can get there by clicking the shop link on the homepage. We got hundreds of products on there for Patriots, by Patriots. We're talking T-shirts, freeze-dried foods, books that I would recommend reading, bumper stickers, and so much more. So just keep that in mind. If you guys are interested, check it out. You know, anything that you purchase on there will go to help make our podcast bigger and better. So, you know, I really want to thank you for your support. And, uh, you know, with that said, I know we've uh, we've been trying to move to other systems and whatnot. Uh, we have a uh, Patriot FB system that we're trying to set up, PatriotFB.com. We're going to be broadcasting on there eventually, uh, but there's some technical glitches, and most of that is my inexperience and, <laughs> and lack of uh, ability to understand uh, mixers and mix minuses and very technical know-how stuff. So um, with that said, I will keep you guys updated whenever we make the move. Uh, just check us out at uh, facebook.com forward slash on the move show for more information on that switch. And uh, you can also join our group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash on the move show. So I know that was a lot of website information. So I got some more here for you in case you that wasn't enough for you. Uh, we have a segment that we do every Friday on Sounding Off with Tank and Tony. Feel free to tune in. Uh, their show starts at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, but uh, I join them on their show at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Their their show is here at Blog Talk Radio as well. It's blogtalkradio.com forward slash Sounding Off with Tank and Tony. I do a few minutes on their show, and we talk about whatever issues are uh, relevant at the time. So uh, with that said, I've, I've been asked by the Libertarian Party of Washington to uh, ask my audience to participate in a booth that they have going on at a Pride event. Uh, if you're interested, the link is uh, link for their event is at uh, facebook.com forward slash Libertarian Party of Washington. That's W-A Washington, uh, and you can find more information there. So like I said, we got a lot of news going on right now, and we're going to try to get to it all. Uh, you know, it, we've talked about last week uh, the, the VA scandal. We didn't get an opportunity to get to it. I'm going to try to get to it this week uh, and how the head of the VA resigned. I, I will try to get to that, but uh, that's at the bottom of our pile of things that, uh, that we're going to get to. Uh, I definitely want to talk to, uh, talk to you all today about the situation in Iraq, the explosive situation going on in Iraq and how this uh, terrorist organization, uh, ISIS, is now basically making a play for, for more power in that uh, political vacuum uh, known as Iraq. So with that said, uh, we have a lot 
of stuff that uh, that we're going to try to cover. We're going to get uh, to uh, the Snowden interview with uh, Brian Williams if we have time. I'm going to talk more about uh, Bo Bergdahl and the uh, top five terrorist leaders that were exchanged, uh, that were being held in Guantanamo Bay, and basically President Obama's uh, inconsistency with this. But uh, at this point, we're actually going to move forward into the first segment of today, and uh, we like to call this segment This Day in History. This Day in History. Because people have got to know whether or not their presidents are crook. Well, I'm not crook. Yesterday, what our country can do for you, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this world. A date which will live in infamy. To fight in the fields and in the streets. To fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. All righty. So today, as you all may know, is Father's Day. And uh, just in case you all did not know, um, my father, uh, I am Mac the Third. My father is Mac Jr., and I would like to give a Happy Father's Day to him. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you, and I hope you're having a good one. Uh, so anyway, uh, according to History.com, uh, on June 15, 1775, the Second Continental Congress voted unanimously to appoint George Washington head of the Continental Army. Washington had been managing his family's plantation and serving in the Virginia House of Burgesses uh, when the Second Continental Congress unanimously voted him to lead the Revolutionary Army. He had earlier distinguished himself in the eyes of his contemporaries as commander of the British Army in the French and Indian War in 1754. Born a British citizen and a former redcoat, Washington had by the 1770s joined the growing ranks of the uh, colonist, uh, sorry, colonist. Uh, colonists, I can't speak today, sorry guys, uh, who were dismayed by what they considered to be Britain's expl- exploitative policies in North America. In 1774, Washington joined the Continental Congress as a delegate from Virginia. The next year, the Congress offered Washington the, ro- the role of commander-in-chief in the Continental Army. After accepting the position, Washington sat down and wrote a letter to his wife, Martha, in which he revealed his concerns about his new role. He admitted to his dear Patsy, uh, that's what he referred to his wife as, that he had not sought the post, but felt it was, uh, it was utterly out of my power to refuse this appointment without exposing my character to such censures as would be reflected dishonor upon myself and given pain to my friends. He expressed uneasiness at leaving her alone. He told her that, uh, in an updated in his w- or that he had updated his will and that he hoped that he would be home by fall. On July 3rd, 1775, George Washington officially took command of the poorly trained and undersupplied Continental Army. After six years of struggle and despite frequent setbacks, Washington managed to lead the army to key victories, and Great Britain eventually surrendered in 1781. Due largely to his military fame and humble personality, Americans overwhelmingly elected Washington their first president in 1789. Now, you know, with that said, I'm sure I've discussed this with you all. Washington is my favorite founding father uh, for a lot of different reasons, but uh, he actually he created the the principles that we've seen followed throughout history, where we have this reluctant politician and. Uh, you know, it, he actually kind of uh, looked up to uh, Cincinnatus, uh, Cincinnatus, something like that. He's a Roman general, uh, and and uh, he basically was the same thing. He was a farmer. He he uh, gave up his power willingly, and this is what Washington t- did as well. He's uh, he's our Cincinnatus. So I think it's uh, it's it's really interesting. Washington could have been king of the United States, but he decided that he wanted to give up his power. I mean, it, no one really expected him to give up. The power, uh, even King George. So uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, feel free to look up your own history on it, but I, I really like this founding father. He's one of my favorite ones. So uh, with that said, we're moving on. If you want to join the conversation today, uh, you can give us a call at 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. And at this point, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. 
You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. And we're back. I appreciate you guys sticking with us. So at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and go into an, another segment of the show, and we like to call this one Ask Mac. It's time to ask Mac. you got a question? He's got the answer. All right. If you've got a question that you would like me to answer on the air, you can ask your questions in several ways. You can email us at talk at on the move show dot com. You can post your questions on our Facebook page, Facebook dot com forward slash on the move show. You can tweet us at on the move show. Uh, and when you tweet us, make sure that you include the hashtag Ask Mac so I can find you on there. Uh, and I'll read your questions live on the air and try to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, I have a question that was asked to me earlier this week from Aaron on Facebook, and uh, he asks, what is the full extent of the concept of separation of church and state? Uh, is it employed within the Constitution? Is it in the First Amendment? Uh, he had some, some questions about it, and also it's, uh, its potential misuse within our government. So let me, let me first point out that there are several points that you know, I'd actually need to discuss in order to fully answer this question. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I just have studied things, and I look things up. And feel free to do your own research on this. Like I said, don't take anything I say as scripture, but you know, based on my research, this is what I have discovered. So first, I just want to point out that the United States Constitution only protects us from the federal government violating our rights enumerated in the, in the bill of rights okay so so it only protects us from those rights that are enumerated in the bill of rights um in the constitution the u.s constitution so does this mean that the u.s constitution does not protect us from state and local governments yes that's exactly what this means and this is why we have state constitutions now you know i'll get to this a little bit more uh but uh, the first amendment let me just talk about that for a second the the first amendment of the united states constitution begins with congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof it says congress congress and when it's talking about Congress, it's, it's referring to the United States Con Congress because it's the United States Constitution. So with that said, it only prohibits the federal go government from establishing or prohibiting a religion. So, so the second thing that we need to talk about is the actual – the term separation of church and state. You know, Where was this term used? Where was it at? Because uh, it's not in the Constitution anywhere. Well, the term separation of church and state was first used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. He wrote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between a man and his God, that he owes no account to none other, or to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence. That act of the whole American people which declared that the legislator should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So keep this in mind. This is, this is the wall of separation that, that we're, we're being told exists, the, the separation of church and state. This, this letter is the foundation for that. So what was he talking about when he said that? Uh, this was in reference uh, because th there had been a lot of discussion that Thomas Jefferson was a uh, it basically going to attack religious rights uh, once he became president. Uh, there was so much fear 
and uh, fear mongering about Thomas Jefferson that that people of the time they were actually burying their Bibles in in their backyards it, because they were afraid that Thomas Jefferson would would come confiscate them. I mean, this is the kind of fear mongering that was happening at the time. The election uh, that Thomas Jefferson was in for president it was fierce and it was very very vicious. I mean, th- there was a lot of uh, a lot of slandering going on. So anyway. Uh, this was in reference – the letter that he wrote, he was talking about uh, how he was reluctant to set aside calendar days for religious observance as the president of the United States, even though Washington and Adams had done this. But Jefferson wouldn't, and you know, even though as the governor of Virginia, he did that already. He actually already did those things, and, and why did he do that? We'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, let's let's remember that. We'll put a pin in it and get right back to it. In 1947, the United States Supreme Court began to misuse Thomas Jefferson's words. In uh, in Eversense versus Board, the Board of Education, the United States Supreme Court was asked to interpret the First Amendment's prohibition on laws respecting an establishment of religion. In other words, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the words of Jefferson. Uh, the justice has famously declared the First Amendment was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state that must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. Not only did the, the, the justices put words into Jefferson's mouth, he never said anything about high and impregnable and that uh, we couldn't approve of the slightest breach. He, he didn't say anything about this, but they also misinterpreted his intentions. And we'll talk about that here. Uh, according to Heritage.org, throughout his public career, including two terms as president, Jefferson pursued policies incompatible with, high and impreg- with the high and impregnable wall the modern Supreme Court has erroneously attributed to him. For example, he endorsed the use of federal funds to build churches and to support Christian missionaries working among the Indians. The absurd conclusion – that countless courts and commentators would have would have us reach is that Jefferson routinely pursued fo- uh, policies that violated his own wall of separation. Jefferson's wall, as a matter of federalism, was erected between the national and state governments on matters pertern- uh, pertaining to uh, religion, and not more generally between the church and all civil government. So, in other words, Jefferson placed the federal government on one side of this wall. And the state governments and churches on the other side, the, the wall's primary function was to delineate the constitutional jurisdictions of the national and state governments, respectively, on religious concerns such as setting aside days in the public calendar for prayer, fasting, and thanksgiving. Evidence of this jurisdictional or structural understanding of the wall can be found in both the text and the context of the correspondence between Jefferson and the Danbury Baptist Church. So what does all this mean? You know, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you all, but, you know, in my opinion, I think it means that Jefferson was not a hypocrite. You know, he simply believed that the federal government had no place imposing central religion upon the entire country. He believed that the First Amendment prohibited the federal government from setting aside in the public calendar days for prayer, fasting, and thanksgiving. However, it did not prohibit it and prohibit the states from doing so. And with that said, unless your state constitution has an establishment clause like the one in the First Amendment, which prohibits the establishment of a state religion, it offers you no protection against your state endorsing any particular religion. Jefferson's refusal as president to set aside days in the public calendar for religious observances contrasted with his actions in Virginia where in the late 1770s he framed a bill – for appointing days for public fasting and thanksgiving. And as governor in 1779 designated a day for public and solemn thanksgiving and prayer to Almighty God. Jefferson relied on the Tenth Amendment, arguing that because no power uh, to prescribe any religious exercise has been delegated to the federal government, it must then rest with the states as far as it can be any human authority. So here's a perfect example for you as to what I'm talking about. In Washington State, where I live, Jefferson would have been prohibited from spending public monies on missionaries and building churches, as he did because of the Washington State Constitution. And I'll read a section from you here. Uh, Section 11, this is referring to the freedom of religion. Um, 
there's a, a, a sentence in there, and it says, No public money or property shall be appropriated for or applied to any religious worship, exercise, or instruction, or the support of any religious establishment. So we can clearly see that Washington State has its own establishment clause. You know, this is this establishment clause is what separates a state government from the church. So we have the United States government separated in the, in the U.S. Constitution, and the Washington State Constitution separates the church and the state of Washington. You know, I I don't know if every single state has an establishment clause in their constitution. Honestly, I haven't read every single state's constitution, but if your state doesn't, then your state could, in fact, endorse a particular religion, and there's no protection against it. Now, just a caveat on that, uh, Washington State has made some amendments to this, uh, this provision, uh, this section of the Constitution, in which it allows things like chaplains and, and, and hospitals and things like that, uh, and other government-provided, uh, um, basically, uh, religious services. So you know, keep that in mind. Uh, they have amended it to, to allow certain things that they're doing. So, but this all brings us to a greater point, and the point is – is that if you've never taken a look at your state constitution, then perhaps it's perhaps it's time for you to do so. You know, the only thing preventing your local and state governments from infringing on your rights is the the state constitution. You need to know what it says. You know, I used to not understand how important the state constitution was. You know, I thought it was redundant and I, I didn't think that we needed it. I thought that the US Constitution protected me from everything. But I've recently come to the conclusion, based on evidence like what I just discussed, that I was wrong. I mean there's piles of evidence showing that the state constitutions protect us from the states, and the U.S. Constitution protects us from the general, i.e. federal government. So each one protects us from something different. But as I always say, the Constitution does not give us anything. It doesn't give us rights. It simply enumerates them, and it tells the government which rights they cannot violate. And I would just like to point out that even though a right is not enumerated in the Constitution, that does not mean that it is not a right. So anyway, we're moving on. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Aaron for joining our conversation and for getting on the move. Uh, again, if you have a question and you'd like to answer, have me answer it on the air, you can ask it in several ways. You can call us at 619-924-0986. You can email us at talk at onthemoveshow.com. You can post your questions at facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow. You can tweet us at onthemoveshow. Uh, and don't forget to include the hashtag AskMax so I can find it. Anyway, at this point, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to have Libertarian Party candidate David Steenson on the line. So don't go anywhere. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. And we're back. All right, so at this point, we're going to be joined by our special guest, David Steenson. He's running uh, in the Libertarian Party as a candidate for Washington. Hey, David, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mac. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. So uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, give you an opportunity. Uh, can you tell my listeners what district you're running for and what position? Yes, I'm running in District 19. I'll uh, be running for position one for state uh, representative yeah, out of Longview. I live in Longview. Yes, sir. So uh, who's the uh, the incumbent that you're running against right now? I'm going to be uh, taking on Dean Taco. I see. And is is he a Democrat? He is a Democrat. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So, you know, with that said, uh, you know, I, I know you've you probably listened to my interview with uh, Paul Addis. I, I have a, a lot of the same questions for you, uh, you know, just myself. Uh, I'm curious uh, it, specifically, what are some of the big issues that, that you're bringing to the table? What are things that, that most concern you and you're running on in your campaign? Well, the biggest thing is the intrusion of our government into our family lives, our businesses, our schools. Uh, job creation is a, a definite uh, number one priority with me. Uh, my opponent uh, over the past several years has done little to, uh, to nothing for businesses in my district. Uh, his rating is at, right now at 10% on a scale of 1 to 100%, 100% being the best uh, legislative uh, representatives to support businesses and uh, Dean Tackle currently is at the bottom of that totem pole. Yes, sir. So so what uh, in particular would you do different to create jobs? Uh, I would interact more with our, our businesses within the district, uh, create new methods, new ways to uh, engage our citizens of our community and the businesses, uh, get with our farmers and find out what programs we can have offered through the schools and if they're not sufficient enough, develop new programs so we can get uh, high school uh, kids out there uh, working and uh, interacting with farming, uh, with our mills, our lumber mills, and our shipping lanes. Uh, we, there are a lot of opportunities, and uh, right now, government uh, squashes a lot of that opportunities with uh, overabundance in uh, regulations. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and you know, I I definitely agree with that. We we see that we're getting basically uh, a noose tightened around our neck uh, every year. It seems to get tighter and tighter. Uh, you know, the the foot of the government is is basically you know uh, stepping on our neck, and and we we're being restricted. Uh, we're being so limited and restricted now that it is costing jobs. You know, with things like Obamacare and and all the regulations coming down uh, from the EPA and whatnot, it it just makes it really difficult to to start a business, to run your business. You know things like uh, the the minimum wage and whatnot. What's what's your opinion of the minimum wage? What happened in Seattle? Well, I believe that uh, minimum wage it shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be a minimum wage. If you as an individual go to an employer and he offers you eight dollars and you feel you're not worth eight dollars, then you seek other employment. Um, Putting minimum wage, uh, such as they did in Seattle, uh, starts to stifle. It will stifle business. Uh, some business owners may not be able to afford uh, $15 an hour per person. And also there's a lot of other hidden factors that come in, FICA, uh, unemployment insurance. These are other things that are going to increase for a small business. Um, the individuals that are wanting the $15 an hour uh, generally uh, – probably ought to look at uh, putting some time into the business, learning the skill, mastering it, and then uh, going from there. Uh, all of us have started out at the bottom and worked our way up. Uh, it's pretty unfair if you've got an employee and you're in one of those areas that's been there for 10, 15 years and they're making $16 an hour, and then all of a sudden the city council ups the uh, ante to $15 an hour for a minimum wage. That's uh, – if people are talking about fair, I don't see that there's a fairness in that. But then again, fair, fairness is only going to be um, what the individual thinks fair is. Uh, just because they say $15 an hour, why didn't they go to $25 an hour? Uh, okay. Or better yet, why not go to $100 an hour? I mean, if we're, if we're sitting there looking at a, a small group of individuals that think they are owed a, a certain price, then... Uh, that's not correct. Uh, they're not. Everybody has to work from the bottom up. Everybody has to pay their dues and get their feet wet. Uh, I've done it. Uh, I'm sure you've done it. It's a hard struggle, but uh, one that can be rewarding rewarding in the end. So I, w I would say that I disagree with any minimum wage whatsoever, and that's up to an individual. Go to an employer. If that employer doesn't pay you what you think you're worth, then I suggest looking at a different employment option. Yes, sir. Yeah, and you know I, I've always heard, and, and I have to agree uh, with the whole uh, philosophy that you cannot regulate or enforce any kind of fairness. Uh, it's it's just not possible because when you start trying to regulate fairness, it, you end up becoming unfair to somebody else. Like for example, you know the, the minimum wage. You know, it, first of all, these people are basically saying that they're entitled to this amount of money. In in my personal opinion. 
you're, you're entitled to nothing. The only thing that you're entitled to is, is a fair chance. It, it, you're you're entitled to to basically, you know, put your all into something. And, and if if you fail, you fail. If you win, you win. You know, I, I mean, this is this is just life. It, when you take out all the risk and and you start, you know, saying that people are entitled to to this am- amount of money and you have to pay this amount of money or even in terms of Obamacare, you know, you say you're entitled to government health care, okay? You're entitled to, to health care. That means that you're entitled to that doctor's time. And with that said, I mean, it, how, how do you say that you're entitled to somebody else's time, somebody else's money? You know, it, those aren't entitlements. Those are, those are not rights. Those are things that, that aren't fair. The fairness there to, of what somebody else, I guess, is subjective is, is what you were saying. Uh, it, it depends on whose view you're looking at it because now that doctor, I'm sure it's not fair to that doctor that, that now he has to give up some of his time for free or for less than it's worth or, or for that employer who's now – employing somebody at $15 an hour uh, when they, you know, that person isn't worth that much money to them. So, you know, fairness cannot be regulated just like morality should not be regulated. In my opinion, I don't think that we should be trying to uh, regulate morality through acts of prohibition and, and, and things like that, like we did back in the 1920s and like we're doing with, uh, with, with drugs now. Uh, what's your opinion on the war on drugs? I believe we shouldn't have a war on drugs at all. An individual decides he wants to smoke a, a bowl or a joint after work or in his privacy of his own home. That's his business. That's not my business. If it doesn't affect the life or limbs of other individuals, then by gosh, go ahead and do it. Uh, you're not going to affect me any. It's no different than uh, saying you want to go to the bar after work and, and pop a top, but yet you can, uh, can't leave the bar, your job and head home in the car and pop a top and uh, drink a cold one on your way home. So... It's about control, and if the uh, government can tr- control you and the citizens allow them to be controlled, then who, who's going to speak up? I mean, it's going to get so bad that individuals will finally come together like they're beginning to do now. Enough is enough. We don't need their control. If we're given the, the responsibility and we're supposed to be cognizant enough to be able to vote for a re- representative or a president, then we should be able to make certain decisions as far as what light bulbs we put in our home, what toilet paper we use, or the type of toilet we we decide we want to flush with, or the sheets <laughs> in our bedrooms or the the cleaning supplies in our in our laundry room. It, it's just gotten way out of hand, Mac. And I, I know that you see it. I'm sure you experience that even with your radio program. You've got certain regulations which, uh, to most, really won't know. They they don't experience that. Just like I, my current job is uh, transportation. I relocate families coast to coast. So we have so many different regulations. They become so un, under uh, uh, excuse me, become so cumbersome that uh, the smartest person in the room is not going to know them or will have the time to figure them all out. As one regulation leads to several others in a passage, and no several others will lead to several other more. So it's just it becomes redundant to a point where it's it's obnoxious and we there's no need for it we need to simplify our laws we need to get away from incarcerating nonviolent crim- criminals uh if somebody goes out and they sell a dying bag did they did they hurt anybody did they did they kill anybody if they didn't put them on the street have them attend a program and let them go about their business i mean Everybody wants to excel in life. It's kind of like the immigration uh, amnesty program. They, people say, well, we want, want to go ahead and give amnesty to all the illegal immigrants. Well, because they just want to have a better life. Well, that same philosophy could be applied to a criminal breaking in the car. He's doing it because he wants a better life. Or, or the bank robber going in and robbing a bank. He's doing it because he wants a better life. But the, the thing is, is it's illegal. And until it's be, is given the chance to be legal on uh, a lot of the um, drug regulations and laws, then uh, we need to start looking at how do we get our people back out of being incarcerated. There, currently, we have over 6.8 million people in the penal system, whether going in or coming out. Uh, and that's a heck of a lot of folks we have in, in our country that are tied up into the, the penal system. Yes, sir. Yeah, and we have, uh, I think, three, last time I checked, there's 330 million Americans in the United States, and we have per capita more prisoners uh, in our prison system than, than any country in the world. You know, it, even, yeah, and, that, even, and that doesn't even include those in court fighting cases or finding, trying to fight themselves out of a case. 
Exactly. It's a, it's, a, it's a money racket. Yeah, I mean, and we compare the you know the United States to countries like China and Russia, where we we hear about like the authoritarian grip that they have on their population. You would assume that there would be more people in prison in those countries, more political prisoners in those prisons, uh, you know, easily more than 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 what the United States has, especially considering the vast population difference in China compared to the United States, but we don't. We, we actually, from, from my last uh, check on it, we have approximately the same amount of, of prisoners that China does in our prison systems, but China has per capita way, way, way Perfect. more people. Yeah, so, so it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, we are the most authoritarian country in the world with these kind of policies that, that turn you know people into criminals when there was no no victim of that crime. But yeah, you know, it, I totally, uh, totally agree with you on this. You know, the war on drugs. You know, I, I really liked Ronald Reagan. Uh, obviously, that was before my time, but I, I like Ronald Reagan. But this is the one, one real thing that I, I don't like about Reagan is that he started the war on drugs, and I think it's done more to to damage our our, our country than it's done to help. I, I think that there are already existing laws on the books that make crimes that that people do when they're on drugs. Crimes. I mean, for example, somebody driving under the influence, that's a crime. You know, somebody, somebody stealing something to get drug money, that, that's already a crime to steal. So I, I think that the fact of having, having somebody you know, uh, be arrested for something that, that didn't violate anyone's rights, the sheer act of, of doing drugs or buying drugs or something like that, that, that there was no victim there. And if they used, if nope. used and then commit a crime, you know, I, I, that's already a crime. So why are we why are we going after the drugs? Let's go after the crime. And and, and more importantly too, if if you want to be tough on drugs and things like that, we could have enhancements. Uh, you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, and he he was he was telling me about this idea that he had. I don't know where he got it or if it was original, but we could put an enhancement for a crime. Let's say you steal something and you were on drugs. You could have an additional enhancement for. For being on drugs while you committed a crime, or or something of that nature, you know, it, it just to me it makes sense that that we punish the crime, not the victimless crimes right now that we're doing. It, those are, are just filling our prison systems full of people who, who didn't do anything to violate anyone's rights. So it, and I, when I definitely... you get and excuse me, Mac, but when you get right down to it, are, are they much? Are they any different from illegal aliens coming into this country from all parts and in, inlets of this, this continent? Um, they're so, they're seeking a better life, aren't they? Aren't they trying to or attempting to seek a better life? Um, it's ridiculous that we have so many people incarcerated. The laws are over cumbersome, and it's just way too much. It's, it's too much for individuals to bear, and, and it burdens communities. It, it breaks up families. And when in the individuals, when they're young people, and they go into these prisons, what are, what are they being surrounded by? Other criminals and hardened criminals. And is that mentorship or is that uh, giving them new leadership to follow in, in a direction that would not be suitable in society? Exactly. And, and there are studies proving that, you know, once people go into the prison system, they're, they're very uh, likely to go back into it. And, and the fact is, too, is we have a, a society now where we basically discriminate against people who have served time in prisons and th that could prevent them from getting jobs and, and things like that. You know, it, it, for me, this is just my personal opinion, and I, I'm curious what you have to say about it, Dave. Um, when we have somebody who's released from jail, that person has – we're told that that person has paid their debt to society. So if they've paid their debt to society, then why are we allowing them to be discriminated on uh, from getting a job, making their life more difficult, and then more likely to go you know, back into some kind of uh, crime activity, which would put them back in jail? I mean th these kind of things, it's, it creates a cycle, a very repetitive cycle here that we see where people are uh, you know, first-time offenders. They get put into the system, and now they're in the system in and out continuously. Well, that's the problem. They, they come out, they've served their time. If they've had to serve five years, ten years, then they come out and they have to be on probation. Uh, you were charged with ten years, uh, you did your ten years, that should be the end of it. If you did not commit a felony that involved death, injury, rape, then you should be giving back your rights. You paid your debt to society. You should be able to vote. You should be able to uh, request for a concealed weapons permit. Uh, a lot of those things are valid uh, questions, and we need to 
get people together that are like-minded and say, you know, enough is enough of treating our families and, and people like this. We're supposed to be a free society, but we're free to a, a limit. Um, we are in a soft tyranny. And the more regulations they pump out every month, uh, whether it be at state level or federal level, they're there to in, enhance the, the, the criminal system. I mean, they want to make criminals out of uh, small children selling lemonade in, in say, uh, Atlanta. That took place a couple of years ago because the child didn't have a food and health safety uh, certificate to sell lemonade. It, those are ridiculous things. Uh, it's just like, a guy in, in a subdivision in Colorado hangs a, uh, a flag, a Betsy Ross flag, with a circle of 13 stars. And he's getting a uh, $200 fine uh, for having that flag being flown on his property because he lives in a uh, so-called gated community. It's just ridiculous things. So people need to mind their own business, take care of their own problems first, because every time they point a finger at somebody and, and what they may be doing – they might want to look. Through. They've got four more fingers pointing right back at them. And, uh, <laughs> we need to take care of ourselves before we can work on taking care of other folks. And we need to eliminate a lot of these laws. And a lot of these folks that have come out of the penal system, out of prison or out of jail, they pay their debt to society. They are supposed to be able to get a fresh start, start all over. Uh, if you hamper them and then give them remedial jobs of, you know, Going, you know, the only job they can get is being a dishwasher for three fifty an hour. That's not fair. Is that fair? Sure. They should get five dollars or ten dollars or fifty dollars. So again, we're get you right back to uh, what's fair, what's not fair, and who decides what fair is. Yeah, exactly. I I definitely agree with you on that. But you know, obviously, I think there are some concerns with uh, with. Uh, you know, felons or, or uh, people who have been in the prison system for violent crimes, uh, getting their their firearms back, or, or or other other kind of situations where maybe somebody was a pedophile and now they're applying for a job as a school teacher. You know, certain things like that. I think they shouldn't be allowed to even get there out. There are certain limitations to it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. But in my opinion, you know, if if they have in fact served their uh, served their time and they paid their debt to society, we shouldn't be allowing them to get out of prison if there's any chance whatsoever of them repeating that that crime, that act. So absolutely. You know, w- with that said, if we get rid of all these nonviolent drug offenders, we'll have more room in our prisons to actually keep the the threats to society in there. But uh, I definitely agree well, that if somebody has committed you know a, a, cr- a heinous crime, uh, uh, you know, where they have committed violence or they've they victimize a child, something like that. They shouldn't be put in a position where they can, you know, be back in charge of a, of children or something like that. that. That doesn't make sense. But I definitely don't no, agree with that sense. them being prevented from getting a job elsewhere, another field that that would uh, that would not have anything to do with that and would allow them to reintegrate into our society if they have in fact actually paid their debt. So you know, I, th- I think you and I are on the same page with that. Yes, I think we are, Matt. Okay, so, so with that said, you know, I, I want to move on and actually get to you a little bit, give our listeners an opportunity to, to, to basically get to know you. Um, and I'm curious uh, if you could give us a little bit of background on you, Dave. Yes, I um, was brought up in a military family. My father was the CW3 in the Army. I joined the military after school and uh, went in the Army, and I also did uh, my, my uh, three and a half years in the Army and my four years in the Marine Corps. And uh, since then, I've been a contractor. I've been a contractor since 1986. Uh, my wife just recently got out of the military, which brought us back here to Longview. Uh, she was originally from the area, went to school and born there. I work hard. I'm a, like I said, I'm a contractor. I, on an average week, I employ anywhere between 15 to 20 individuals. And sometimes I use them a uh, second time, other times uh, just once in, in, in a while. Uh, we believe in uh, our Constitution. I took an oath to protect the Constitution and defend it, protect our citizens, and I stand firm with that. Then uh, it bothers me to watch uh, how our government has taken a turn south. To be able to know that our president uh, signed orders to release 36,000 illegal criminals with a minimum of three felonies each year last year, over the course of last year. 2,000 of them which were known murderers, and another 18,000 of them were pedophiles and uh, rapists. So we, those are my concerns, and, and a lot of those things are, were driven to 
uh, for me to run as a candidate and, and to seek office. We need to have individuals that are going to stand for our freedoms and stand for liberty and stand for uh, not stand against a tyranny. Um, right now we're in a soft tyranny, and a lot of folks may not uh, see that. I'm sure they feel it. Uh, we have high inflation, which is being masked. Uh, if you go to Walmart by uh, great value, you're going to be spending 2.96 on a gallon of their milk. But when it's locally locally uh, manufactured, yeah, you're going to be spending almost four bucks, if not more. And uh, so there's some inflation that's hidden in there. We have a governor that's added 11 cents to our tax, to gas, gas tax, and they're proposing to add another dollar here shortly. So what we're spending on fuel now, you can look at it with another added dollar to uh, as applied in tax to, uh, for some project that uh, neither anybody in my district or your district will be uh, utilizing. Uh, they've increased, uh, they've added a 50 cent uh, cigarette tax, which uh, should be coming in play here shortly. So these are a lot of issues that we have going on. And, but my primary is getting our young people jobs bringing jobs into our districts, whether it be District 19, 17, or any other district in the state. Uh, we have a high unemployment. And just in the Grays Harbor um, community, there, there's a 9.9% unemployment. In my district, it, it's hitting 79 to 8%. Uh, you get around uh, the Pacific, uh, Long Beach area, that that's high, too. That's up in there in the nine range, too. So we've We've got a lot of unemployment. We've got uh, folks in different uh, food banks we, that are out collecting food. In, in one community I know of, there's 26,000 families that are involved in collecting food from these food banks each month. And that's a tremendous amount of families that uh, we're having to uh, have them go to char charitable uh, places to collect food. So if that's one community and we start looking at what's going on statewide, we have a big issue. We have a big problem, and it's, it hasn't quite manifested itself fully yet to where uh, it affects every single individual in the state. But it's coming. And, yes, sir. Uh, with the high, high inflation that we have, uh, the higher fuel costs, the lack of jobs, and we've got people being laid off. We just had a, what, a coal mine up in the Cheyos area shut down. There went uh, a good bit of good-paying jobs. We have the uh, bulk millennium in Longview. We have people protesting about exporting of coal. Uh, coal's been exported out of that area for over 100 years. Um, the, the company and the uh, state are working on cleaning up uh, the remnants of what was left by, behind by Reynolds Aluminum. And uh, they can bring jobs to our area. And we yes, got to look at what can we do for our children because our children are going to be the next phase of seeking jobs. And if we can't get our young people employed, how are we going to look at getting our children jobs when they, they come out of school? Well, I, you know, I couldn't agree more with you on that. And, and I think that the, the people in Seattle are going to see more and more uh, trouble, basically, from more and more unemployment, more and more uh, uh, unemployed youths. Uh, because of the the new uh, fifteen dollar minimum wage, there's talk of making that statewide. It, it's it's very concerning to me uh, because of uh, exactly you know the things you're talking about. It's it's hard enough as it is. Uh, we, we have in America right now. We have a real problem. I mean, one in six Americans go to bed hungry. That's I mean that that is a real problem. And the the answer is not more government to that. I believe that the answer is less government. Uh, so. You know, I think we're on the same page with that, and I, you know, I, I appreciate where you stand on that. And I'm curious, you know, specifically in terms of you, uh, what experiences or, or qualifications do you think that you possess that that make you uniquely qualified for this position more so than the incumbent? Well, I have owned businesses. Uh, currently, like I said, I'm a contractor. I've had a computer company, a, a technology company. Uh, I've also my last few years with my wife with her being in the service, I was a family readiness group leader. I was elected to that position. We brought that uh, that organization where it had little to no funds to where it uh, met all regulations for that company as far as funding goes for the family readiness group. Uh, 
I've uh, worked with over 480 different families, military dependents. Um, my family is real pro-military. Um, and we've seen a lot of different changes uh, take place to businesses. I, I'm familiar with what it takes to make a payroll. Um, my, incumbent, uh, the, uh, my opponent, uh, has he ever had a business? Nothing that I see indicates he's had his own business or ever had to meet a payroll. Um, but yet he's there wanting to raise taxes every time we turn around. Um, so I know what the burden is on the, the, the business uh, person. I know that burden. I've been there. And, I'm, I, and I have to deal with it every day. My average person that works for me makes $15 an hour. The, general, the young men that I have in the Seattle area that were making $15 an hour are probably going to want $25 an hour now because why they're going to compare it to why should some guy at McDonald's make $15 an hour when they're out asking to move furniture for $15 an hour. So they're going to weigh it based on the level of work they put in, physical labor uh, mm -hmm. experience. So <laughs> I hope that it does not go statewide, uh, the $15 minimum wage. Uh, if it does, you're going to look at uh, burgers going up. I mean, you go to Mickey D's there, McDonald's. Uh, you're spending right now a dollar menu will turn into a $5 menu. I mean, it's, the impact is going to be unbearable to most families. Uh, go to Walmart, bananas now, what, 64 cents a pound? They'll go up. They'll, they'll be over a dollar. Uh, you'll be spending eight, nine, ten dollars for a gallon of milk just to cover a Walmart employee's wages. If it goes up to fifteen dollars an hour, um, that's a heavy burden to place on our state. And such at a time when economically our country is not doing well. If we want to utilize the U3 rating for unemployment, it says we're at seven point two percent. But if we use the unemployment ratings that went were taking place back in the eighties, we would be well over twenty four percent unemployed in this country. We're talking, what, 90, almost 90 million people to 100 million people are unemployed, out of work, or no longer looking for work. That, that's incredible. I and mean, these are more than capable adults that could get out here and find a job. But with the so, amount of regulations and stipulations that government's placing on uh, business for health care, taxes, who wants to, who's going to hire them? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I I definitely agree. There's there's so much things going on, and I, I imagine a lot of this is what drove you into politics and drove you to to run for office in the first place. But uh, I'm Absolutely. curious, you, you know, with uh with your uh your being in the Libertarian Party, uh, I'm just curious if uh if before at one point you were a Republican or maybe a Democrat or uh, you know what made you decide to run specifically for the Libertarian Party and rather than being like a Republican or Democrat. Well, I come from a Democratic family. Uh, I knew I was a Republican, and I was a Republican for 32 years. Um, but I see in the Republican Party, as well as in the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party is not my father's Democrat Party that he grew up with, nor my grandfather's. And the Republican Party is not what I knew over the past 32 years. We have progressives that infiltrated both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. And their agenda, their complete agenda is uh, socialism and communism and control of you, me, and the rest of our citizens. Uh, so picking libertarian was an easy choice. They're about the individual having freedom, limiting government, limiting government's intrusion into our lives, getting government out of our bedrooms, our schools, our local businesses, out of our churches, out of marriage, giving the individual their, their own power that they already have, reigniting that, that, that constitution within each individual, saying, hey, I'm free. I'm free to make cognitive choices that do not affect the lives of other people, but my own, and I take responsibility for that. And we need people to step up and take responsibility for themselves. If they're down and out, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and, and move along. Help, go to your family. And if your family can't help you, go to your church. Go to your friends. They'll help you. Don't depend on government to give you a helping hand. Um, and we used to do that in this country. People depended on themselves, on their families, and on their community, not the government. And the more people depend on the government, the more of a thumb hold uh, that the government has on the individual. Yes, so that's, those are my those are driving factors 
why I went with the Libertarian Party. They fit all current um, positions I, I hold. I, I don't think government needs to be dictating who can marry who. That's up to a church. That's up to an individual. Um, that would be like uh, asking me about abortion. Uh, that's not my choice. I'm a male. That's the female's choice. Uh, get government out of it. Let the female and her family and her doctor decide what's best for her. Uh, the, I'm a male. I could never, you know, deal with the emotional uh, pressure that comes with such a choice. So getting government out of our lives and letting and getting government back to doing what it's supposed to do, protecting our borders, protecting the interest of the United States, and let our states protect their borders and let our communities provide jobs, educate our children the way the individuals in our community want that to be done. Um, and, and that would take us right into Common Core. Huh? So, a lot of, lot of questions I know that you have, Matt, and uh, I'm <laughs> free to answer any one of them or at least give my opinion on it anyway. Well, I love I love uh, your answers to this, and you know, it, it, you make for great radio. You know, I, I ask a question, and I you you just got so much information for for the listeners out there, and I sure do appreciate it. But hey, uh, Dave, no, we no. got to take a quick commercial break. Uh, would you mind sticking with us? I'm really enjoying talking with you. Certainly, I have plenty of time. Thanks, Matt. All right, well, thank you. We'll be back with more Dave Steenson uh, when we come back, and uh, don't go anywhere, everybody. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. And we're back. I appreciate you all sticking with us. When we last left, we had David Steenson on the line. He's a Libertarian Party candidate here in Washington State. And uh, we're going through the issues here and just asking him a series of questions to kind of find out where he stands. I want you guys to uh, basically be able to get involved and get as much information as possible. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask, feel free to join the conversation. The number to today's show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. And uh, at this point, we're going to bring Dave back on the line here. And uh, are you there, Dave? Yes, yes, we are. All righty. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you because I know I know before we were talking about how how big the government is, how how complicated the laws have been, and uh, how, how basically difficult it is for the average individual to understand what's going on. Uh, and, and you know, we can relate this to the the tax code and and how. We have, you know, armies of lawyers and the IRS and, and you know, uh, tax agents that are basically writing this code that 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 no one could possibly sit down and understand at all. So, uh, what's your opinion of the of the current tax system that we have here, and and do you think that uh, there would be a, a better one that we could employ? Yes, I think our current tax system is over cumbersome. It doesn't do what it should be doing, and it's grown so much, like you were stating, uh, a CPA that, you know, has been doing accounting for years and years, finds it difficult to research and, and find certain deductions. There are so many different deductions uh, for individuals that it becomes uh, redundant, and we need to look at eliminating the IRS altogether. We don't need it. We, we can go to... Um, a simpler solution. I have ideals on a, on a tax solution uh, that may not fall within uh, some people's uh, parameters. But you know, prior to uh, the 1900s, did we, as individuals, pay federal tax? No. Did our country survive? Yes. 
did we uh, have to depend on government for roads? And no, those should be state-driven uh, initiatives. Uh, that I think the government needs to be out of that. We we need to get the government out of what we do as individuals. They need to do what they're supposed to be doing, protecting our borders and interests of the United States. So just Period. to clarify, though, it, it, when you're talking about the government out of uh, out of our interests as far as building roads and things like that and collecting tax money for these things, are you referring to the state government as well, or is that particularly relating to the federal government? That's relating to the federal government. Uh, the state has its boundaries. And we should not, the state should not give in to the federal government. In fact, the state should be controlling what the federal government does. Uh, we as citizens should be controlling what the federal government does. And we do that through our, our, our local initiatives, through our state. And th- our representatives need to, to put the, the hammer down on the federal government and say, hey, and enough is enough. You're not going to be doing this. And we need to get delegates together. We need to support Article 5 of the Constitution, and we need to get term limits on these individuals because the longer they're in government, they create rules and regulations and laws that kind of keep them in place, Uh, and it's ridiculous. I mean, 1951, uh, FDR ran for a fourth term and won, but, you know, passed away, didn't complete it, but, you know, in 1951, they wrote regulations that uh, kept presidents just at two terms. But Congress uh, did not write their regulations to uh, hamper uh, how long they can be in. Yeah, so we well, need to have I, term limits. I think that they they realized after that that they you know they almost uh, slipped into a a situation where it was like a dynasty, uh, an empire of sorts, uh, and they realized the problem. You know, FDR was a progressive. I, I'll just point out, and he the was. progressive ideology. You know, they kind of they don't follow suit with what you know that George Washington did as far as voluntarily giving up power. Progressives they take power, they take more and more power, they create bigger governments. These, these whole it, it, philosophies of the party of the of the movement of the progressive movement it's 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 the whole creation of government uh, becoming the the answer to the problem which they created in the first place. So you know, I I definitely agree uh, with with the 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 sovereignty of states but we we've, we've lost a lot of state sovereignty uh, i'm sure you know you mentioned article 5 uh you know the, the uh, of the constitution uh but i'm sure you know that we have basically lost with the 17th amendment where uh it the senate used to be selected used to be voted on based on the state representatives the state legislators used exactly. to decide who was in the the us senate and now uh, the Seventeenth Amendment passed, and boom! Now it's voted on by the people. We have double representation. States lost a lot of their sovereignty, a lot of their ability to poke back. And you mentioned Article Five, like I was saying. Article Five of the Constitution, for our listeners, uh, basically says of ways to amend the Constitution, and it talks about a state convention where states can come together and and basically uh, vote on uh, amendments to the Constitution. And and Mark Levin, I'm sure you're you're familiar with him. He has a book, The Liberty Amendments. Uh, feel free to check it out. It's on our website if you want to purchase it on themoveshow.com in the shop link in the gear section. But there there's a lot of different things that are beneficial about Article Five. Is that you know we can bring a, this country back to a more constitutional republic. We can get our states' to sovereignty back by proposing these amendments. And the great thing about it is it only takes 14 states to block an amendment. If we cannot get 14 states together to block an amendment from a runaway state convention, then we have already lost, as I've already said, and and Mark Levin has already said, and I personally, I would rather know if we've lost our country now than our country later when it gets much worse. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing to that, Mac. If Congress, let's say, and the House is taken by the progressive Democrats and the Senate is taken uh, hold and remains in the Democrats' hands, what stops them for introducing uh, proposals or, or bills to allow the uh, president to go for a third term? There will be nothing to stop that, even though the laws are already in the books. But who's going to stop that? If you get two-thirds of the vote of, of the House and of the Senate, he's he's got it. And this is where the delegates come in from the states at Article 5, is that we need two-thirds of the states. They can ratify uh, new articles that term, term limit and can override what the House and Senate does. Exactly. And this gives control back to the states and those citizens of our state. And so we need to, to push that agenda forward and uh, 
get a grasp, grip on these folks and, and pull them back, pull them back on the reins and put it back in their tracks. They are our servants. And when you go to into public office, you're a servant of the people. And that was reflective a lot during prior to 1901, where you look at a lot of the voting record, a lot of the, I'm sorry, when you look at a lot of the state reps and uh, the Congress and Senate, they served one term. And if they had to go the second term, usually it was because they couldn't find anybody to replace them in the first term. But uh, after the... Uh, Woodrow Wilson, the Progressive Party movement, uh, things change. Uh, it became more, becoming more of a career politician was the way for folks to go. Right now we have in the state of Michigan a Carl Levin. He's been a senator over 40 years. Uh, there's another senator that has over 40 years as well. These folks have made a career of politics, and they don't need to be there. The whole intent of our uh, framers were to get folks in there to represent their communities. They still had their own jobs. They had businesses or, or work for some of it. They went there for one term and returned back to their business, their farms, and whatever they were doing prior to, to running for office. And that's what we need. We need more citizen politicians. We don't need career politicians. Well said. Well said. So, so with that said, uh, David, uh, where can my listeners go to get more information about you, volunteer, and, and specifically to your campaign, and and what exactly would you would you like uh, them to do? What, what do you need help with? Well, we're, we need volunteers to go out and, uh, with me and knock on doors. I uh, also need donations. You, to run a campaign without donations can uh, be difficult, but it can be done. And I'm not uh, looking to seek donations from corporate entities. Uh, one thing, oh, one of our libertarian philosophies is if we start getting revenue or donations from corporate businesses, folks kind of feel like they have an obligation to that business. Um, I have an obligation to all businesses. I have an obligation to bring business and grow business in our communities and make sure we have regulations for this business. And not one business should be treated differently than another. Uh, it's kind of like me moving furniture. You know, if I move the guy that pushes a broom in a business, I treat him no different than I would the CEO or the owner of the business. Uh, give them both the same respect equally and you do the right job. And um, so as far as donations go, yes, I'd, I'll take them. We need them. And uh, mostly I'm looking for volunteers to help knock on doors and, and get our message out there. Um, you can find me at www.votesteenson.com or you can, on Facebook at votesteenson or Facebook at david.steenson.7. Uh, and seven was not something I did. That was Facebook. How do you spell uh, uh, three avenues? uh, uh, Just so the listeners know, how do you spell Steenson? Uh, It's uh, it's it's like S T E E N S O N, right? That is correct. Okay, just making sure. Uh, So, so with that said, you know, people check out his his website. If you if you want to get involved, you know, make sure you get in contact with him. Or you know, if if you don't know how for some reason you can't get in contact, contact me. I'll put you in contact with him. Um, and, and I, you know, I just have one last question for you, David. I, yes, I, I know running for political office, you, you've had to have made certain sacrifices. Uh, you know, more importantly, obviously your time. But but what other kind of sacrifices have you made in order to run for office? Well, my sacrifices are minuscule compared to the veterans that have served our country, to the veterans and service members that are currently serving. I mean, we've got men and women out there that have given life, leg, and limb um, to, to secure our freedoms here in this country. And to see such disrespect uh, being given towards them, whether it be the VA or sitting there watching uh, Iraq do what it's doing after we've spent countless amount of years since 93 in in that area to sit here and watch it fall apart. Um, those things are dishonoring to our veterans. And what the VA has been doing is dishonoring to our veterans. There are good people that work at VA, the volunteers. I don't want to take anything from them, but we have, there's a management problem. And I, as a participant, participant in the VA, I, I, I too get those delays. So I 
fully aware of what uh, our, my brothers and sisters in the military are going through, our, our former vets. <laughs> and and it's, uh, it's not good. So what I've sacrificed is nothing compared to uh, what uh, my fellow uh, military members have had, are going through and have gone through. I never served downrange. Uh, my wife was active military as well. I've seen a lot of families, uh, husbands and wives, go downrange, and I've had to deal with it on the FRG end of it. And it is um, can be quite uh, depressing at times, but we pick our head up. Uh, one thing about service members, we'll always pick ourselves up. We can move forward. Um, in the Marine Corps, our motto was do as much as you can with little that you get. And uh, that's what we, that's what we do, and, and I apply that motto uh, to this day. Do as much as I possibly can with the, with as little that I may have. And, yes, sir. Uh, I would encourage all all service members and, and uh, veterans. You know, we can make a change. We can we can for, force this government to take heed to uh, our service, and we we serve this country with honor. We serve this country for, for the rights and freedoms of others. And citizens that didn't serve, that contribute to our service members, you know, bless them as well. We, we need them too. But uh, what's happening uh, here in this country now, it's uh, disgusting. I, you know, I, I have to agree. We, we definitely feel it every day, uh, the federal government encroaching more and more on our liberties. And, and you know, I just want to say thank you uh, for coming on the show. And more importantly, thank you for your service. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely appreciate that. And uh, it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you, David. Uh, you're welcome on any time. Any time, Mac. You just let me know. All righty. Well, well, thanks again. So at this point, guys, we're going to go ahead and cut to a quick commercial break, and when we get back, we're going to uh, start the uh, next segment of the show. It's called The Mac Attack, Uh, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. We're back. I appreciate you all sticking with us. So today we have a lot of crazy things going on in the news. And in this segment, I give you my take on outrageous events in the news. So if you'd like to join the conversation today, please give us a call. The telephone number is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. So I know most of you uh, have been following the headlines this week, and you've heard about the terrorist group in Iraq and Syria called ISIS, or I-S-I-L, and how they're taking control of the territory in Iraq. Uh, You know, with this said, you know, there's been a whole lot of stuff going on with there. And I just want to mention the fact that according to foxnews.com, long before it looted the Iraqi Central Bank of Mosul, uh, of four hundred and twenty nine million dollars that's million four hundred and twenty nine million dollars the Islamic State in Iraq and the uh, Levant slash Syria, which is sometimes is called ISIL, sometimes it's called ISIS, ISIS, uh, was a well funded it was already well funded to a- establishing its Sharia caliphate. For those of you who don't know, a caliphate is basically they want to create a Muslim state, you know, where 
they create a Muslim empire, all right? And uh, thanks to uh, raging criminal enterprises of extortion, bank robbery, and petty theft, as well as donations from well-heeled sponsors throughout the Arab world, the latest payday gained the jihadist group led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, they basically – they overrun uh, Iran's second largest city and emptied the vaults of cash and gold bullion. Uh, this basically has created this uh, big conglomerate terrorist organization. Now, this group is now the most well-funded terrorist group in the world. It now surpasses the, the wealth of the Taliban, al-Qaeda, and even Hamas. It's estimated that the cost of 9-11 terror attacks, all right, those attacks were estimatedly – with training and all the logistical stuff behind it, it cost them $30 million. So now this terror group has $429 million in their coffers. This is insane. You know, we have a serious problem to contend with now. And, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about it, if I'm honest. Uh, this is what President Obama had to say about it. He, he had a uh, press release that he came out with uh, last week, and uh, this, is, this is his press release. Good morning, everybody. I uh, want to take some time to give you a quick update about the situation in Iraq. Yesterday, I convened a meeting with my National Security Council to discuss the situation there, and uh, this morning I received an update from my team. Over the last several days, we've seen significant gains made by ISIL, a terrorist organization that operates in both Iraq and in Syria. In the face of a terrorist offensive, Iraqi security forces have proven unable to defend a number of cities, which has allowed the terrorists to overrun a part of Iraq's territory. And this poses a danger to Iraq and its people. And given the nature of these terrorists, it could pose a threat uh, eventually to American interests as well. Okay, hold on. I have to stop right there. All right. It, he said, this is his words, it poses a threat to Iraq and its people, and it could pose a threat to American interests. I find it a bit odd how he can see how the situation in Iraq could pose a threat to American interests. Now, what about the top five terrorist leaders that you just released, Mr. President? Your administration keeps telling us that they're not a threat to us, even though a 2008 Pentagon dossier on Guantanamo Bay inmates determined that all five of the men that were released were considered to be a high risk to launch attacks against the United States and its allies if they were liberated. I mean, this is blowing me away. You can see how this is a threat to national security, but you can't see how that is a threat. Uh, here he is. Here, here he goes some more. Now, this threat uh, is not brand new. Uh, over the last year, we've been steadily ramping up our security assistance to the Iraqi government with increased training, equipping, and intelligence. Now, Iraq needs additional support to break the momentum of extremist groups and bolster the capabilities of Iraqi security forces. We will not be sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq, but I have asked my national security team to prepare a range of other options that could help support Iraq security forces, and I'll be reviewing those options in the days ahead. We will not be sending U.S. troops back into combat. This is, this is him, him saying this right now. He's, he's, before he's even had an opportunity to look at the situation, apparently, he hasn't even reviewed all the options. He's saying now that we will not send U.S. troops back into Iraq. By saying this, he is now announcing clear intentions to ISIS, to this terrorist organization, the most well-funded terrorist organization in the world, that we are not committed to securing Iraq. So why, why is he announcing this? You know, I, I think this kind of statement makes us look weak, and we see this president continuing to make us look weak on the national stage over and over and over again. You know, at least if he didn't say whether or not we were going to commit troops, you know, there would have been – they wouldn't have known the level of commitment that we have. By not saying anything, they would not have known that they're not going to be unimposed, basically. But this president is a man of words. He's not a man of action. So my question to you all is – does the Iraq's stability, does Iraq's stability actually matter to us as a country? You know, if not, then, then let's just part ways. Let's just get out of there. You know, I, I want to be clear first, though. I was not for the war in Iraq to begin with. But once we were there, we committed. We couldn't just pull out. 
and leave people who stood up against the Taliban and other terrorist organizations, they would have been killed. And the Taliban would have filled that power vacuum that we created by toppling the government of Iraq. We took Saddam out of power. We created this power vacuum. And now this is all going on because of our involvement. We are responsible. How about some personal responsibility? You know, it, We created this problem. This is our problem. This administration, I would just like to point out the fact that this administration would like us to believe that it was some great achievement to pull troops out of Iraq. You know, they claim that they ended the war in Iraq. They, they ended the war in Iraq by removing the troops. Does the war look like it ended to you guys? They simply cannot declare that a war is over when it clearly is not. And let's point out the fact that Obama would have stayed longer if he could have got the Iraqi government to sign the force agreement where American troops would not be subject to Iraqi laws. He tried to stay longer. This so-called huge accomplishment, this, this achievement that we're being told that the Democrats, Hillary, Obama, all these people, they did such a good job. You know, It was nothing more than putting people on a plane. How difficult is it to put people on a plane? What kind of accomplishment is that to put people on a plane? Seriously, this is not an accomplishment. If anything, this is people turning tail, putting their, putting their tail between their legs and, and running away. All right, we were there. I'm not saying that I agreed with the war to begin with. I think that we, we definitely should not have gotten involved. That was not our responsibility. But let's look at the world now. Iraq is a far, far less safe place. and it, The world is far, far less safe now, being that Iraq is, is falling apart and, and Saddam Hussein is not in power. It, it's so much more unsafe than it used to be you know we've created this problem we have to step up and actually do what's right i don't personally think that we should have left iraq the way that we did but that's just my personal opinion and i'm sure especially in the libertarian party this is where we disagree i'm sure that libertarians out there are thinking hey we need to get out of there we got no business in that country but look we started the problem all this stuff is going on now because of us so anyway he had more to say this is what obama had to say about it I do want to be clear, though, this is not solely or even primarily a military challenge. Over the past decade, American troops have made extraordinary sacrifices to give Iraqis an opportunity to claim their own future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Iraqis leaders have been unable to overcome too often uh, the mistrust and sectarian differences uh, that have long been uh, simmering there, and that's created vulnerabilities within the Iraqi government, as well as their security forces. So uh, any action that we may take to provide assistance to Iraqi security forces has to be joined. ...differences to promote stability and account for the legitimate interests of all of Iraq's communities and to continue to build the capacity of an effective security force. Uh, we can't do it for them. And in the absence of this type of political effort, short-term military action, uh, including any assistance we might provide, won't succeed. So this should be a wake-up call. Iraq's leaders have to demonstrate a willingness to make hard decisions and compromises on behalf of the Iraqi people in order to bring the country together. In that effort, they will have the support of the United States and our friends and our allies. Now, Iraq's neighbors ha also have some responsibilities to support this process. Nobody has an interest in seeing terrorists gain a foothold inside of Iraq, and nobody is going to benefit from seeing Iraq descend into chaos. So the United States will do our part, but understand that ultimately it's up to the Iraqis as a sovereign nation to solve their problems. Uh, indeed, across the region, we have redoubled our efforts to help build more capable counterterrorism forces so that groups like ISIL can't establish safe haven. And we'll continue that effort through our support of the moderate opposition in Syria, our support for Iraq and its security forces, and our partnership with other countries across the region. We're also going to pursue intensive diplomacy uh, throughout this period, both inside of Iraq and across the region, uh, because there's never going to be stability in Iraq or the broader region unless there are political outcomes that allow people 
to resolve their differences peacefully without resorting to war or relying on the United States military. Uh, we'll be monitoring the situation in Iraq very carefully over the next several days. Uh, our top priority will remain being vigilant against any threats to our personnel serving overseas. Uh, we will consult closely with Congress as we make determinations about appropriate action, and we'll continue to keep the American people fully informed as we make decisions about the way forward. All right. So, you know, he's going to wait several days to make any kind of action. And by then it could be too late. You know, th there may not be an Iraqi government left to help if we wait too long. You know, the president refuses to take action. And as I have said before, he is a man of words, 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 not action. And it blows me away that he's getting it. He wanted to get all involved in Syria. He wanted us to get in there to uh, he at first he he kind of reined himself back he said oh you know I don't want to put boots on the ground but we want to get involved in Syria based on how they were killing people not that they were killing people but how we were upset that they were using weapons of mass destruction chemical weapons but before that we had no problem with the fact that they were killing people with machetes and bullets and bombs but but then suddenly oh they use chemical weapons and now we have to get involved but now we see that Obama it's dragging his feet on the Iraq situation. And my question to you all is, with all the blood and treasure we lost in Iraq, should we just cut our losses? Or, or should we continue to make it, 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 make it safe? Or should we make sure that it doesn't become a safe haven for terrorists? Should we make sure that it doesn't become a breeding ground for more terrorist attacks against the United States? You know, there's a lot of things that, that – that we really have to think about. I mean, is it really worth this? And, and I'm not saying I necessarily think that we should go back in full-fledged into Iraq, but I do have a fundamental problem with the way that we left. I mean, we just basically packed up and left. And now this, the equipment that we've left is falling into terrorist hands. It's being used against the government that we've set up. It's a less safe place because we left. So, so is it worth it? Should we get back in, involved? Is, is the risks of not getting involved going to create a terror state, which it seems like is happening right now in Iraq. I have here on the line uh, Chris. He's he's actually stationed in Iraq, and he'd like to comment. Chris, are you there? Here, how are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Uh, by the way, thank you. Uh, thank you for calling in, and thanks for your service. Oh, no problem. And if you hear radio, that's my radio from work. I'm actually working right now. But um, like I was um, – I don't know if you remember. I believe it was in 2011 when Obama – Came on TV and he said, "I'm bringing troops back. I'm cutting um, the troops in half, and um, I'm going to bring other troops back before uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving." And that's when um, my mission changed to instead of defending the base, train the new people and give the base to the Iraqis. Well, <clears throat> as that was happening, um, they were taking uh, our countermeasures away because we were turning them to the Iraqis, so we're not going to leave any equipment there, or we're going to leave the base and their trainees. Well, um, one incident that I really wanted to call about and to show the incompetence of the Iraqis watching the base was that one morning um, we had about 15 cows reach per, uh, the perimeter, and nobody knew how the cows got inside the base. Sounds funny, but if you get in the mindset of a Terrorists, how many explosives can you fit inside a cow? Exactly. <clears throat> another thing that I told and I, I I brought it up is that most of those uh, most of the people working with us they were uh, I, like a double agent. You know, they would work for us, but when they were leaving, and they even told us um, there were checkpoints run by the uh, Al Qaeda. They will stop the taxis because they will take tax taxis from their house to the base to work. They will stop the taxi and they will threaten to kill their families if they wouldn't give any information. And when they told us that, you know, it was a big red flag. So we had to, you know, cancel that uh, worker, and that worker was no longer to come on base. But then again, you had the people that didn't tell us. So it was like a double-edged sword of who can you trust. And literally, when I left in November. Um, I literally called it. I was like, there's no way we can leave here in 2011. 
because of the way that we left. It was more of a, literally, I'm telling you, it was, for me it was surprising. Literally, Obama said that. The next day, the base was literally on bare minimum, like, uh, mission essential personnel. I was like, okay, really? Like, yes, like you said earlier, um, we had to quit. I didn't want to go in Iraq, but we did commit to it, finish it, not just say, I'm leaving, all right, see you later. And now look at what happened right now. And then exactly. I, I saw earlier on the blaze that they were talking about um, the Baghdad uh, airport was being, uh, how you say that, um, rockets were being fired into the oh, Baghdad they're, they're airport. Ordering, were they mortar attacking Yeah. It? And I was like, you know, I was like, man, I really called this in 2011. I was like, there's no way that you could just get up and leave the way that we left. And we left equipment behind. We left uniforms behind, you know. And I was like, oh, this doesn't look right. You know, okay, yeah, we have to leave. But the way we left, it was a transition more of like in a matter of a month, we were all out. So so you're not currently in Iraq right now. You, you were there. When, when was no. the last time you were there? In 2011. 2011. Okay. So, so let me ask you, as far as your take on this, I mean, I know it, who, who would want to go to Iraq? I, I don't know anybody who actually wants to go to Iraq. I know people want to serve their country, but as mm-hmm. far as your take on on Iraq now, should we, should we go back in? Uh, should we try to stabilize the region or, or should we just cut our losses? What, what do you think, Chris? The way that it's looking from what I'm understanding, from what I'm reading, from what I'm looking on the news and, um, Right now, like uh, I was listening to an interview, and the person was right. The way that it's looking is um, ISIS is taking over the surrounding areas of Baghdad. And for me right now, it's, it got to the point that boots and ground is not going to help because there are so the they have nothing to lose. And if don't get me wrong, if they send me, I will say yes. Uh, I have to go. But for me, we are winter time to send. Right now, if Obama says, all right, guys, it's time to go, I'll be like, okay, I'll go. But why am I going to go now when the chaos is too big for us, For especially now that he's been cutting uh, the military? And just to add another story to that, um, I received a letter saying that I'm no longer, even though I re-enlisted, I'm no longer uh, in the military as of, 29 September of this year So you could say that I got laid off from the military Also So again it, it goes back to what I said About three months ago uh, On another radio station um, He wants to cut all this military But if you look at it He wants to do more stuff with the military When the manpower Is not there Exactly Yeah, it, And you know it, to kind of piggyback off Of what you said I I know uh, logistically uh, a lot of things that we do in the military it, when we're leaving a station or leaving somewhere overseas is it, it costs more money for us to bring the weapons back. It costs more money for us to bring the equipment back than, than they're actually valued at. So in a lot of cases, we actually just leave that equipment there, and that's what we did in Iraq in a, in a lot of those situations. We left yeah. equipment. This equipment's falling into enemy hands now. And, and it's going to be used against the government that we're trying to establish. So, you know, I, I, I'm really torn on this because I, I don't like the war in Iraq. I don't, I don't believe in this endless state of war that we're in. But I, I do recognize the fact that we have created this problem. I mean, it, we came in and destabilized the region like we've done with the entire Middle East. We are responsible for the problems that, that happen in Egypt. We're responsible for a lot of what's going on with the ripple effects going through Syria and I mean, there's so much fault to put on us and uh, this administration with our involvement over there that you know it, it's kind of hard for me to see it, it, how it's it's right of us to walk away from this when people over there, you know, some people may have been double agents, yes, but pe- some people over there have actually stood up and stood alongside us, fought with us, they're brothers in arms with us, and to abandon exactly. them like this. And we're just leaving them to the wolves. I mean, it, the, the, these this terrorist organization, they, they're over there killing people, summarily executing people right now, and, and and they're taking over. I mean, this this is our fault. We need to take some responsibility for our actions, I think. And, and, and you know, I know it, it. nobody wants to get back into a war with Iraq, but the, in my opinion, it wasn't over. We just left before it's over. So 
we need to ask ourselves, is it worth it? You know, should we cut our losses? And if so, let's get out of it entirely and 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 not involve ourselves in that and get in this isolationist bubble kind of thing. Or let's get involved, complete the mission, and do it right and and commit to it fully. But but anyway, that that's my take on it. And I yeah. Sure and one one yeah one more other point that I would like to make was I was also in Afghanistan. So I did a tour in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, and I I totally agree with you in that there's people that I could personally know, and I still keep in touch with some of them. Personally, you know, there was one gentleman, he was 18 years old. This was in 2009. He was uh, 18 years old, just turned 18. He started working um, as a guard with us. And one day, this kid comes crying to us. And I was the liaison between them and us um, as a guard. And then he calls me crying, saying that Al-Qaeda came to his house demanding, you know, saying, um, we're going to use you no matter what, and you're going to give us information. And he stood up. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I like my job, and I'm sick and tired of you guys taking advantage of us. What they did is they went outside and they fired the entire house. They lit the house on fire. So he comes back to work that same night, and the dude is crying. I was like, oh, man, are you okay? He's like, I need a house. I no longer have a house. So I titled it up to my leadership, and I told him, hey, guys, you know, I know it's not our job, but I really feel bad for this, you know, kid, you know, he no longer has a house, you know, they burned his house, and, you know, we got uh, in contact with the CE squadron, and we're like, hey, all he wants is plywood and wood panels, that's all he's asking for, and so we got the okay for it, you know, we gave him, like, a bunch of wood, and the kid was happy, and I could vouch for some of them. And I could, you know, I could also tell you some other stories of the dudes that, you know, that were taking pictures of us working. And as of right now, on both uh, countries, Afghanistan and and Iraq, especially that um, we went in there, we kind of uh, knocked doors down, rebuilt it, then we started feeding money to the country. Now Iraq, once we left Iraq, then all that stuff started happening. And if we leave Afghanistan, like he's, he said he's trying to do by, I think he said, like, 2016, then Afghanistan's going to fall again. Exactly. And then what? We're going to just quit uh, playing uh, help Afghanistan, then get out, help Iraq, get out, and just go and flip, you know, between countries? I don't agree on that either. I agree. Yeah, it, it, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. You know, it, it's – to me – you know, I have I have friends that, that that have died in Afghanistan. I got friends that died in Iraq, and I, I think it is a disservice to these people. Uh, it, it's it's a disgrace that they've died, and, and we're just going to abandon what they're they're over there fighting for. Now, maybe you disagree with the reasons. Maybe you know uh, people disagree with with us being over there to begin with. But let's let's commit. Let's if we're going to do something, especially in terms of Afghanistan, we are there now. Let's not leave. Until the mission is over, I mean that—that's just to me, just makes sense. There's no, there's no point of us even had going over there in the first place if we're just going to leave and and it's going to be worse off than it was before. Now, Afghanistan is slightly different than Iraq because Afghanistan was already a, a kind of a terror state, so it was already very unstable. It was a harbor for for terrorists to begin mm-hmm. with, but Iraq. We literally toppled the government that was thwarting the, those those influences. We created a power vacuum. This is our fault, and if we're just going to leave now, all that blood that was lost over there, all the treasure we spent, it was in vain. People died for no reason at all if we're not going to do anything about it, and, and this, is, this is basically our generation's modern-day Vietnam, and, and I don't want to see you know, the, the terrorists, the, the caliphate win like communism has spread throughout the world in, in that situation. Now, again, there was a lot of conflict over Vietnam at that time too, but – it, you know, what's right? It, I, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but what I am saying is that this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. And if, if we decide that it's not worth it and we need to cut our losses and we need to cut our losses and start worrying about our own borders, we need to increase border security, make sure that we're safe. If we're not going to go over there and attack the people that want to attack us, we need to come home and really focus on securing our own destiny. But that's just my opinion. I, I really do appreciate you calling in, Chris, and, and thank you so much for your service. Uh, you know, oh, if people no like you, 
people like you, I, I really admire and, and thank you so much, man. Uh, at this point, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about uh, Bo Bergdahl. And uh, don't go anywhere, guys. Thank you. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. All right, we're back. So when we last left, we were talking about the situation in Iraq, the explosive situation where this uh, terrorist group ISIS or ISIL, however they're referring to it nowadays, um, they're taking over territory in Iraq. We're losing ground in what we fought for in Iraq, and we're being told from this administration that, hey, you know what? Uh, it, it, these people that we released for Bo Bergdahl, they're, they're no threat to us. But hey, uh, you know this could potentially be a threat uh, with what's going on in Iraq. And, and we're supposed to still believe that the fact that we left Iraq, we, we just vacated the area and left them to their own devices – that is some kind of great victory for this administration. We have done a service to not only our country, but their country, and we're winning, and we're coming back because the war is over. Well, the war's not over, people. And, you know, th this whole five terrorist leaders who were released in this, this exchange for Sergeant Bergdahl, I mean, th this is really upsetting to me because these people are a threat. They've, like I said before, they, they've already been designated a threat by the 2008 Pentagon report saying that they're a high risk in attacking us, and we let them go. We let them go. We negotiated with terrorists. Anyway, I, I have a clip here, uh, and this clip is, uh, is, is from Fox News, and it's talking about the five terrorist leaders that were exchanged. And it, you know, it, this, this is very interesting. It has a, um, Ted Cruz on it, and they're doing an interview, and, and here's a clip. I'll just let you listen to it. The intelligence community has said uh, clearly that, that these five are not a threat to the homeland. Well, that was Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel hours ago in the first public hearing on the prisoner swap that freed American soldier Bo Bergdahl in exchange for five top Taliban commanders. Secretary Hagel repeating a line we've heard a lot in the last 10 days. I wouldn't be doing it if I thought that it was contrary to uh, American national security. These five guys are not a threat to the United States. Well, I'm glad to get rid of these five people, send them back to Qatar. I'm not telling you that they don't have some ability at some point to go back and get involved, but they also have an ability to get killed doing that. This is John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Obama. I mean, th these people are all trying to, to pound this down our throat saying that these people are not a threat, but yet Obama comes out with a press release that I just played for you not too long ago talking about how Iraq could pose a threat to us. So how, how are you able to reconcile this? You cannot. That's the, the answer. You cannot reconcile the fact that terrorists in Iraq and Afghanistan can pose a threat to American security. They can kill Americans. This is a serious issue, people. Our president, not only did he violate the law, and I've, I've spoke about that before. There's a law that's, that Congress passed, and mind you, a Democratic Congress passed to, to stop him from doing what he was talking about doing with these prisoners. They told him, no, you can't do this. Not only can you not do it, you have to have approval from us, and you have to notify us 30 days before it happens. And he just ignored the law. That's lawlessness, people. That This right here is an impeachable offense. He negotiated with terrorists. He made us less safe. We now have a policy, have a, basically a presidency of, of 
negotiating with these people. It's going to make them, and they've already said that they will do this. It's going to make them kidnap more terrorists or more Americans. Sorry, not terrorists, more Americans. Because why wouldn't they? They got every single thing that they could possibly want out of it. They asked for five top terrorist leaders, and we gave it back. Of course, they're going to kidnap more terror, or more more Americans, and they already have said that they're going to now. Anyway, here's the rest of the clip. Joining us now, Republican Senator Ted Cruz of the state of Texas. Senator, good to see you tonight. And so your response, I mean, you've got the president, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, the presumptive Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, all saying, assuring the American people that these five guys do not pose a legitimate threat to America. Well, well Megan, that, that, that is stunning to see, because what we've seen happen here is the President of the United States has negotiated with terrorists to release five senior Taliban terrorists. And, and what they're saying, they're all reading the Democratic Party talking points, but what they're saying is not backed up by the facts. All five of these were senior members of the Taliban, which was intertwined with al-Qaeda, whom I, I know no one needs reminding, on September 11, 2001, murdered nearly 3,000 people on the American homeland. And, and these terrorists, our young men and women, our soldiers, went and expended blood and treasure to capture these five, five senior terrorists. They were high priority targets. We captured them. And by releasing them, you know, the president made one very candid admission when he was asked. He said it was, quote, absolutely possible that these five senior terrorists would return to actively waging war against America. We're still fighting the war. The Taliban today is fighting against the men and women of our military, trying to kill Americans today. But possible and, and isn't the same thing as probable. And what Hagel said today, what, what Secretary Hagel said today, was that there was complete unanimity on this decision among the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Department of Homeland Security Chief, the Director of National Intelligence, Clapper, who, by the way, a few years ago said he was, we all know what's going to happen if we release these guys, and he didn't mean rainbows and unicorns, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, if the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs is telling the President, don't worry about it, and you're the president, why wouldn't you listen to all those people? Hey, look, I, I would just like to point out the fact that one thing that Obama said is that at the end of hostilities, there are prisoner exchanges. He's referring again to the fact that the war is over, the war of terrorism with terrorism is over, and that now we are at the point where we release prisoners and, and they do the same thing. That's what happens at the end of hostilities. This is not a nation state that we're at war with. We're, it's not like we're at war with, with you know, some country. We're at war with terror, all right? And though I disagree with, with labeling wars on something, war on drugs, war on this, war on that, these people want to freaking kill us. The, these people are not to be trifled with, and, and we are just – Basically replenishing their ranks, and not just with some mere foot sh soldier. We're replenishing their ranks with people of high importance to to their commitment to the to their cause. These are people that know how to how to train and lead men. This is really a, a horrible thing for national security. Anyway, here, here's the rest of it. I, listen, number one, this was a decision that was made at the political level. Uh, we know that the commanding generals, we know that the senior military leaders, other than the top political players, were not involved in this decision. And, you know, if you want to know the reaction, look to the reaction of the Taliban. Senior Taliban leaders have been quoted saying that, that this, this release is a huge victory for the Taliban. It's, it's the equivalent of, of 10,000 new Taliban soldiers arriving to fight against America. And indeed, senior Taliban commanders have also said that this now gives them an enormous incentive to go and capture other American soldiers because, it, as the Taliban commander said, it demonstrates the value to such a, quote, rare bird as a soldier that you can yeah. trade for senior terrorists. What about, what about, what about who, who is responsible? Because originally the president rolled out the news in the, in the Rose Garden with Bo Bergdahl's parents. And then we heard that when lawmakers such as yourself got briefed on Capitol Hill, the deputy national security advisor refused to say that the president made this decision, would not go that far despite being repeatedly pressed. He would only put it on Hagel. Then when Secretary Hagel testified, he said it was the president. The president seems to have acknowledged 
implicitly that he made this decision. So why is the deputy national security advisor trying to spin lawmakers that it was all it was Mr. Hagel? Well, because unfortunately, national security in the Obama administration far too often has been treated as a matter of partisan politics. Look, these are the same people that in Benghazi focused all on this story about a silly internet video rather than the fact that terrorists attacked and murdered four Americans, including the first U.S. ambassador killed in duty since 1979. It's all politics all the time, whether it's President well, Obama as a, as or Exactly. All politics all the time. And they would have us believe that Benghazi is not anything that we should worry about. And I have here another clip, and I have to play this because this really speaks to, to what I'm saying about Benghazi, about why we need to focus on Benghazi. This, is, this scandal, we're being – first of all, we are being oversaturated with scandals from this administration, so much so that we cannot keep up, keep focus. It's difficult. But here's what Trey Gowdy had to say about Benghazi. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we will not waver in our commitment to see that justice is done for this terrible act in Benghazi. And make no mistake, justice will be done. That was the President of the United States over a year ago. We're investigating exactly what happened, but my biggest priority now is bringing those folks to justice. That was the president of the United States over a year ago. No one has been arrested. No one has been prosecuted. No one has been brought to justice. We don't even have access to the witnesses. You and the media were good enough uh, for my 16 years as a prosecutor not to tell me how to do my job. And so far in Congress, you all have been good enough not to tell me how to do my job. I'm not telling you how to do your job. But I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you can't answer these questions, then I'll leave you to draw whatever conclusion you want to draw about whether or not the media has provided sufficient oversight. Can you tell me why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi the night that he was killed? Do you know? Does it bother you whether or not you know why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi? Do you know why we were the last flag flying in Benghazi after the British had left and the Red Cross had been bombed? Do you know why requests for additional security were denied? Do you know why an ambassador asking for more security days and weeks before he was murdered and those requests went unheeded? Do you know the answer to why those requests went unheeded? Do you know why no assets were deployed during the siege? And I've heard the explanation, which defies logic, frankly that we couldn't have gotten there in time, but, but you know they didn't know when it was going to end. So how can you possibly cite that as an excuse? Do you know whether the president called any of our allies and said, can you help? We have men under attack. Can you answer that? Do any of you know why Susan Rice was picked? The Secretary of State did not go. She says she doesn't like Sunday talk shows. That's the only media venue she does not like. If that's true, why was Susan Rice on the five Sunday talk shows? Do you know the origin of this mythology that it was spawned as a spontaneous reaction to a video? Do you know where that started? Do you know how we got from no evidence of that to that being the official position of the administration? In conclusion, Congress is supposed to provide oversight. The voters are supposed to provide oversight. And you were supposed to provide oversight. That's why you have special liberties, and that's why you have special protections. Uh, I am not surprised that the President of the United States called this a phony scandal. I'm not surprised that Secretary Clinton asked, what difference does it make? I'm not even surprised that Jay Carney said Benghazi happened a long time ago. I'm just surprised at how many people bought it. You know... He he brings up very good points. There's so many unanswered questions about what happened in Benghazi, and we're being told that it's just a a conspiracy theory. It's it's something. It's it's just a partisan thing that that we shouldn't really give any weight to. You know, pay attention, please. Pay attention to what's going on in this administration. My theory right now is that we are being oversaturated with scandals to keep us 
seeming like the crazy people, the, the tinfoil hat crowd. We're the people that, that are screaming conspiracy and scandal around every corner. Well, I'm here to tell you that there are things going on and that this administration is lawless. You know, it, it really upsets me. I, I'm a very patriotic person, and, and hearing the things that this country is doing, it, it really upsets me. But, you know, I, I'm in need of a pick-me-up right now, and, and I don't know about you guys, but I think it's time that, that we, we do a, a, something that I, that I think is going to pick us all up and, and make us all feel a little bit better. So I have here Red Skelton's Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to play it for you guys here. And, and, and to give you a little bit of a taste of, of – you know what it used to be like in America of of things that that are important to us that I think values that we're losing. So I'm going to go ahead and play it for you guys, and, and I appreciate you guys uh, sticking with us for this. Well, I remember a teacher that I had. Now I only I went I went through the seventh grade. I went to the seventh grade. And I left home when I was ten years old because I was hungry. And I used to. This is, this is true. I work in the summer. And I go to school in the winter. But I had this one teacher. He was the principal of the Harrison School in Vincennes, Indiana. To me, this was the greatest teacher, a real sage of of my time. Anyhow, he had such wisdom. And we were all reciting the Pledge of Allegiance one day. And he walked over. This little old teacher, Mr. Laswell, was his name. Mr. Laswell. He says. Uh, <laughs> he says, I've been listening to you boys and girls recite the Pledge of Allegiance all semester, and it seems as though it's becoming monotonous to you. If I may, may I recite it and try to explain to you the meaning of each word. I, me, an individual of a committee of one, pledge, dedicate all of my worldly goods to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love and my devotion to the flag, our standard, O oh glory, a symbol of freedom. Wherever she waves, there's respect. Because your loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts freedom is everybody's job. United. That means that we have all come together. States. Individual communities that have united into 48 great states. 48 individual communities with pride and dignity and purpose all divided with imaginary boundaries, yet united to a common purpose, and that's love for country. And to the republic, republic, a state in which sovereign power is invested in representatives chosen by the people to govern. And government is the people, and it's from the people to the leaders, not from the leaders to the people for which it stands. One nation, one nation, meaning so blessed by God, indivisible, incapable of being divided with liberty, which is freedom, the right of power to live one's own life without threats, fear, or some sort of retaliation and justice the principle or quality of dealing fairly with others. For all. For all. Which means, boys and girls, it's as much your country as it is mine. And now, boys and girls, let me hear you recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I really appreciate you all sticking with us uh, and tuning in week after week. You know, our listeners are why I do this, and I really thank each and every one of you. That's our show for today. I want to thank Dave Steenson for uh, joining us as a special guest today. Make sure you check out his website, votesteenson.com. And, uh, 
You can get more information about us again, uh, our show. Check us out at onthemoveshow.com. Uh, you can also check us out here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, get on the move.